something. We as Christians have a hope that the world does not know anything about. They do not understand us. And consequently, the Bible says they cannot understand us because they do not have the Spirit of God. So that we that have the Spirit of God understand the things of God, and I say about most, amen, but there's a lot of things we don't understand why God does what he does, but we have to thank him anyway. In 1620, there were 102 pilgrims, but 56 of them died from starvation, disease, and the cold weather. In 1621, 46 pilgrims and 91 Indians met to give thanks for a bountiful harvest and the preservation of their lives through the winter. Because of their circumstances, they had every reason to be depressed and in, in discouraged but they were thankful anyhow. We need to learn, and that's what I want to talk about today, is we need to learn to be thankful in the midst of whatever we face because we have Christ in our life. And ultimately we know because we read the back of the book, amen, and Christ wins, amen, and we are on his side. Let's pray together as we begin. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy that you extend to us in difficult times and and lord i know that you always walk with us and father a, a special moment i want to take and just pray for those who are in texas suffering under this severe hurricane and flooding god we know what it's like to be there and we need not forget our brothers and sisters and those uh, in texas who are suffering right now we ask god that you put your hand on them and use this as a time to minister to unbelievers let the church rise up and let the people of God take hold of the situation and bring faith and comfort and encouragement to those who are suffering. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the, ba the book of Habakkuk, I'm probably going to get that twisted back and forth, so you just bear with me. The book of Habakkuk was written against the backdrop of apostasy, judgment, and unbelievable hardship for the people of Israel. It was written during a time of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah. During that time, the, he was leading the people back into idolatry and literally away from God. We see that happen in today's world. We see people who are trying to lead us in the wrong direction, away from God. As a result, God is preparing judgment on this nation of Judah. Habakkuk's having trouble understanding why God would take a heathen nation and use them against God's own people 
And we're going to look at that in detail this morning. But Babylon, God raised Babylon up to punish Judah. Habakkuk is having trouble with this. And he can't understand why God doesn't just purge the sins of the people and bring the people back to himself. Wouldn't that be so wonderful if God just said, all all right, y'all are just being disobedient and and so I'm going to purge your sin and I'm going to bring you back to me. Let me tell you something. God did exactly that through persecution of the Jews by the Babylonians. God does not want to just be the quick fix God in our pocket every day. He wants to be the God that we serve and love and obey because of our devotion to him, because of who he is and certainly what he's done for us. He cannot understand why God just doesn't fix it. Can I get an amen? How many times in our lives have we prayed, God, just fix it? It reminds me of the time that I'm going to have to tell. Diane always says, oh, God, you're going to tell another one of those stories. But, yeah, it was uh, my first church in Tallahassee. I was getting up, and, and I was trimming my beard, you know, and trimming my mustache, and the little tip on the mustache trimmer fell off, and I whacked the whole half of the mustache off. And I said, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I said, Diane, come look at what I've just done. And she looked and she says, oh my gosh, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. She said, just fix it. (laughs) Sometimes we expect God to just fix it for us, and he doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I shaved it down on both sides, so it wasn't quite so noticeable. I want you to look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 with me. It says, this is Habakkuk's complaint. He says, how long, Lord, must I call for help? But you don't listen or cry out to you. Violence in the land, and you do not save. You see, the Lord answers with a strong admonishment to to Habakkuk, and he says, look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. We, just like Habakkuk, we don't see the big picture and we can't because we don't have God's perspective on what's going on. But I'm going to tell you that God is saying to us, if you will follow him, then if you will get in alignment with God in your life... God is saying to us, individually and collective as a body of Christ, you need to look around at the nations and you need to watch because through your obedience, church, God is going to do something that we would not believe even if he had told us. Because Habakkuk didn't understand everything that God was doing, we could compare him to Job, couldn't we? He argues his case, but in the end he realizes that God is not to be worshipped merely because of material blessing or physical blessing. But simply God is to be worshipped because of who he is. So he ends his words in Habakkuk last chapter with a song of thanksgiving. It's a song to God for who he is and for the unchanging benefits of those who belong to him and know him. Habakkuk had reason to fret. But he only chose to be thankful instead. What's going on in your life today that you've got reason to be confused about, concerned about, even fret about? What is going on in your life that you won't let God take charge of? You know, we don't do that, and we don't do it for a reason, is because we are not aligning ourselves perfectly with God. And what happens is we start looking at our circumstances And we start saying, oh, woe is me. You know, that was the Pharisees in in Matthew. Woe is me. And I'm going to tell you, we got to get our eyes off self and get our eyes on Jesus. Amen? We've got to get our focus back where it should be if we're expecting God to do mighty things in the land in our day. And he will. He wants to. The key to this verse in the last chapter is though and yet. Habakkuk is saying, I sure don't understand all that's happening around me, but I'm going to thank God anyway. So look at Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. It says, Though the fig tree does not bud, 
And there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Regardless of how things may look on the surface, we have reason to thank God anyway. And here is what I want to share with you this morning, some of those reasons. Before I go into that, I, I have to, I'm, I'm drawn back to this verse 19. The sovereign Lord is my strength, and he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. Do you get this picture? You know, in, in Eastern writing uh, where this came from, we, we get pictures we don't just get words that tell us something we get pictures and we get a picture here of a deer being light on his feet can you see him springing as he runs through the woods springing and that tells us that when we allow God to be our strength that we can spring have a spring in our step if I can use that term and we can tread on the high ground as we let God be our strength. So why should we be thankful anyway? First of all, because His sovereignty never changes. God's always the same, isn't He? Today, tomorrow, forever, according to the Word of God, God doesn't change. Our circumstances change, but God never does. We see this recorded in Malachi chapter 6, verse 3. Let me flip that. Malachi 3, verse 6. And we see it in Hebrews 13, 8. And we see it also in James chapter 1, verse 17, where God does not change. When we look around at our own economy and the economy of the world, we may become discouraged, and we can, but we can always rejoice in our situation because we know that God is sovereign in our lives and He never changes. We've had Katrina. Now there's another one hit in Texas. There are some major upsets coming in our lives. But if we are in Christ and we hold firm to Him and His strength, we can be rest assured that God's promises will never change. He will take care of us. He will supply for our needs. He doesn't change. While Habakkuk paints a bleak picture of the present, he looks to God who holds the future. The word of the Lord in our Bible, the word Jehovah, which means he is self-existent, he is changeless, and he is the covenant-keeping God. He made a covenant with you and me. The covenant or the agreement is more than a contract. God said, if you will be my people, I will be your God. And we have to choose to be God's people. You know, the, the word on the street is, well, God loves everybody and he wouldn't condemn, he wouldn't send anybody to hell. And you know, there's some truth in that. God does love everybody and God doesn't send people to hell. We choose to continue our evil ways on a destination of hell. But God has made an off-ramp on that interstate to hell. It's called Jesus. And through Jesus, we have an escape of hell through the shed blood of Christ on that cross. He forgave all of your sin 2,000 years ago and say, well, then everybody's going to heaven. <clears throat> I wasn't done. He forgave all of our sins 2,000 years ago. But in order to receive that forgiveness, we must put our faith in what he did 2,000 years ago. And that's where people draw the line in the sand. I'm not willing to do that. Some of us say, I want to put my faith in Christ. I believe and I will allow God to change my life. But many people are satisfied living in the midst of their turmoil and their indecision and their confusion and their disruption and all those dis words because they don't want to change. And that's what God requires. He requires faith that we believe. And within believing on Jesus Christ, it's going to change our life because God says... And he promises this to those who believe that his spirit will come and live and dwell us. The Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's presence is always with us as we believe in Jesus Christ. 
And believing is more than believing here. As Carl says, it takes an 18-inch trip. you got to believe here. And that means that you allow God to do work in your life, to change you. The Corinthians says, behold, all things become new. Everything is changing. And if you don't see a change in a person's life that says, I've come to Christ, then something's wrong with that picture. <clears throat> God is the one that we can depend on in desperate times. We can trust him in troublesome times. We can believe during unbelievable times, and we can lean on him in all times. God is stable. We don't always know what he's doing. <laughs> can I get an amen? I wonder sometimes, Lord, what are you up to? But we can always trust him to do what is right, to do what is righteous and just for us. He always has the best plan. It's a plan first for his glory and second for our benefit. Romans 8, 27, the last half of that verse and 28, says the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. No matter how things may appear, no matter how dim they might look or how overcast the sky may be, you've got to recognize and you've got to acknowledge and believe that God's in control. When 9-11 hit, we were living in Tallahassee. Many of you were here on the coast. Some of you were somewhere else. But I'm going to tell you, it affected all of us. And we had to stop and say, oh my God, what is happening but we have to take a step back and say, whatever it is, God is in control. Do you realize God raises up kings and he takes them down? God raises up presidents and political leaders and he takes them down? God is in control. And it doesn't matter who the president is, whether he's Democrat or Republican or Independent or no name, God has allowed him to take that position for a period of time to do something. It may be to bring this nation to its knees or it may be to raise up an army of Christians in this world to take the gospel to every creature, amen? No matter how things appear, God is still at the helm. If He still knows the best and he always does what's right. This is what we got to realize. God's sovereign. He is God. He's not our genie in a box where we get into trouble and hardship. We say, oh God, oh God. He's not the foxhole God where we only call on him in times where we're in danger. He still knows. He knows everything. If we believe this, then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 becomes more than just a possibility in your life. It says there, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in, listen, give thanks in all circumstances. Now we're talking to the Christian. For this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. We are to give thanks in all circumstances. Doesn't matter whether it's a rainy day or a sunny day. We are to give God the praise and thank him for what he's doing in our life. He is always God. Therefore, we can face the hard times in life and be thankful in spite of what we face. Whether it's death, indecision, conflict, or whatever it might be. Another reason I want to share with you that we should always thank God is because his salvation never ceases. I, I get so excited about this. Um, when Jesus died on that cross... He died for all of my sins, my past sins, my present sins, my future. It was all future to him. I wasn't even born. And what I know for sure without a doubt is that the God who saved me is able to keep me. In fact, the Bible specifically says he is the author, the beginner, the creator of our faith, our salvation, and he's also the finisher of that. So where are we? We're somewhere in between today, in between him saving us and completing our salvation. We're on this road called, $25 seminary word, it's called sanctification. 
It means to be set apart from the world and dedicated our lives to God. We are to walk this walk. And as we do, we're, like our church motto says, we are to connect with God through worship. We are to grow in Christ through Bible study and studying His Word. And we are to serve God and serve one another while we're on this earth. Let me tell you what. Here is a timeline of all eternity, if you can put it on a timeline, and your life is a dot on that line. And you have to make the decision what you're going to do during your little dot. Because God was before you and God is after you, and here's your life today, a dot on a timeline. What are you going to do with it? God only gives you that dot to make a decision. You're either for him or you're against him. There is no middle ground. There is no fence to straddle. And if you are for Christ, it will cost you everything because God requires you give it all to Jesus and to follow him, to take up your cross daily and deny yourself and follow Jesus. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, that's why we're in this period of sanctification. We're learning how to do that. The Bible says we are being conformed into the image of Christ day by day as we walk with him. He is changing us. I may look the same as I did five years ago. Well, maybe 20 pounds heavier. But I may look the same, but on the inside, I'm, be, I'm being changed every day to be more like Jesus. I don't become a little Jesus. I don't become a God. But I become, like I take on the nature of him. And that's what God wants to see in me. And that's why when I stand before God Almighty at the judgment seat of Christ, which, by the way, is not judging my sin, it's judging my works, what I did for Christ here. When I am judged there, then God is going to look at me. He's only going to see the righteousness of Christ. Because that's what Paul said, I put on the righteousness of Christ. It's not me doing these things. It's not me being holy and great. It's Christ in me that you see. Because if we strip away Christ in our lives, we are dirty and ugly and nasty looking. But with Christ on us, that's what God sees. When we put our faith in what Jesus did on the cross, God sees Jesus' righteousness in our lives. So do I know for sure that Jesus is able to save me? Absolutely. We look at um, the process, if you will, of salvation. And we say, well, I, I came to Christ. I was regenerated, changed. I, I went before the judge and he pronounced me, even though I was guilty, he pronounced me free because of what Jesus had done. And then I live this life called sanctification and try to allow God to conform me into his image. And one day there's a change coming on a midnight cry when Christ blows the trumpet and the church rises up, the dead in Christ first and then those of us who are left behind caught up with them in the air to forever be with the Lord. That's when he completes our salvation. Oh, life is uncertain at best. One call, phone call from a doctor or one visit to the doctor can change our whole outlook on life, can it? <clears throat> the word salvation applies to more than just the soul. It, the word means a deliverance or a rescue. That reminds me that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And let me tell you what, I am at a hurt. I'm kind of getting anxious, amen? I look back at my life when I was young and I thought I had a whole lifetime ahead of me. And I did. My lifetime, whatever it was, it was ahead of me. But I thought, it doesn't matter what I do today. If I don't finish it, I'll do tomorrow. I don't look at things like that anymore today. I look at things that God has something for me to do, and he's going to leave me here until I get to the point I've done what I'm supposed to do for him, and then he says it's time to go. And as my brother always said, he said, I just want to lay down and go home to be with Jesus. And one day he came home from work. He told his wife while she was fixing dinner, I'm going to lay down on the couch for just a minute while you're getting dinner ready. He laid down and he went home to be with Jesus. And I bet he didn't, he, it didn't bother him a bit. He missed that meal. And I know it was burritos and tacos because she makes the best. Amen? 
So when we recognize the fact that God is really in control of our life as we give it to him, then we recognize what salvation is really all about. He's coming to rescue and deliver his children. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that, listen to me closely, this is the writings, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith And then it says that it may result in praise, glory, and honor of Jesus Christ when he's revealed. You see, what is our suffering all about? What are these difficult times about? They're to conform us, bring us closer to God, so that God and our, our God might be honored and we might have glory because of who we're connected with one day. I don't have any glory right now. I have righteousness of Christ. But ultimately, God is going to glorify us. God's children are saved to the uttermost once we're saved. The uttermost. I want you to understand, listen to me closely. The Bible says your salvation is not dependent on your behavior, on how good you are, how often you come to church, how much you pray. Your salvation has nothing to do with that. Your salvation is solely based on the faith that you put in Jesus Christ of who he is and what he's done to bring forgiveness of sins in your life. However, before someone thinks, well, then I can just do what I want to do. If God saves you, the Holy Spirit comes to you and the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. And listen, if you think you can be a Christian and do what you want to, you do not have the Holy Spirit in your life. Because he will quicken you and tell you that's not right. Read the Bible. He will tell you if you come to Christ, then you have submitted your life to Jesus. And God will lead and direct. He's not going to make you do these things. He's going to lead you to do them. And then by obedience to Christ Jesus, we obey the word of God. That's why I don't just go do what I want to do in the flesh. I look at what God says, and he says to live this kind of life. In fact, let me be more specific. He says to live a life of holiness, a life that is separated from the things of the world, from evil, to to live holy as God is holy. Now, that's, that's a big bill, isn't it? How can I ever do that? You can do it because God is in you and gives you the power to do what God has commanded you to do. In the Old Testament, the saints got anointed with the Holy Spirit. It would come on them. And the Spirit could leave them, as we see in Saul's case. But in the New Testament, when you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon you. He takes residency in you. He dwells in you, never, never to leave. So you cannot say, well, you know, I did bad today. I need to get saved again. Well, you may need to get something, but it ain't salvation. You've already got it in Christ, and the proof is in the pudding. He is in you. He directs you and inspires you to walk in a life of holiness separate from the ways of the world. Another quick scripture God, uh, for us is uh, Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely. Those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for us. You know, Jesus is interceding for you. The Bible says right now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. Why do we need intercession? Because we are under attack by Satan. He is trying to tempt us not to follow God. He is trying to tempt us to do what our own flesh wants to do. You know the old analogy Flip Wilson had of the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. Listen, I don't even need the devil in my life without Jesus. I can get into enough trouble by myself, amen? But we got Satan trying to lead us astray, even as Christians. God's salvation never ceases. Therefore, we can be thankful anyway that life comes at us. (coughs) Excuse me. Finally, we should always thank him because his strength never falters. Strength is ability, and our strength does not lie within ourselves, it lies within our Lord. Isaiah 40, 31. 
It says, but those who have hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. Your strength comes from God's strength. God in you. Jesus in me. That's the only goodness that's there. The rest of it's just a mess. Do you believe that? Trust me, I'm telling you the truth. Without Christ, I'm a mess. When we're able to stand, he enables us. When we're unable to stand, he enables us. When we can't go on, he helps us. When we're in the deep valley, he leads us to higher ground. God turns doubts to shouts, amen? And he gives us peace in the midst of our troubles. This is what God did for Job. He did it for Paul. He'll do it for you. God enables his children to stand on in their, when their own strength just fails. Paul said, in my weakness, that's when I'm strong. Why did he mean? What did he mean? He meant that even though I'm weak and I can't do what I'm supposed to be doing, in God's strength in me, I can do it. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In his trials, Habakkuk learned some valuable lessons. Mainly, he learned that God is both our salvation and our song. I love that he starts the book of Habakkuk with a complaint, and he ends up with a song of praise and adoration to God. That's the way we ought to be. <clears throat> let's get past the complaint, and let's hang into the song. He learned that he had nothing to fear from life, but that he had a real reason to be thankful for. A real reason. What's going on in your life? You're looking at it, you're complaining maybe about God, you're not helping me, I don't hear an answer to the prayer. Thank him anyway. You remember the story of the woman who came before the judge and she pleaded and pleaded and pleaded and, and the judge is like, you're wearing me down, okay, I'll do what you ask. God wants to hear our continual petitions to him, asking him. He is our daddy. That's the word Abba, Father in the Greek. And it means that I want you to have the picture that you can come to God and just kind of climb up in his lap as a child and he'll just hug you and protect you and supply everything for you because he loves you this much that he died for you. If you're saved, you possess every reason to be thankful, every reason that Habakkuk had. So regardless of what you might be facing today, Look to God, lean on God, and be thankful no matter what.